On a frigid January evening, a fellow sailor told me of a mutual friend who needed extra crew to deliver a sailing yacht from Newport, Rhode Island. I've been told that no sailor in his right mind would ever tempt the fates of the North Atlantic in the midst of winter. However, I readied myself for what would become the adventure of a lifetime. Through gale force winds and a white capping ocean, we headed out to sea, across the Gulf Stream, and southward to the island nation of Bermuda. Winters are known to be bone chilling. I arrived in Newport with the mercury hovering around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. The harbor was encrusted with a thin sheen of ice, but the wind was still and the sun shined brightly. A warming trend which helped melt the harbor ice was also bringing gusty winds. I boarded the sailing yacht Islandia. Its friendly crew showed me to my stateroom and familiarized me with the pilot house, the bridge, and the engine room of this 137-foot catch-rigged sailing vessel. The vessel had recently undergone a major refit of the engine and generators, and sailing after a major refit is known as a shakedown. The trip to Bermuda would be a shakedown voyage in which all systems would be tested by the expert captain and engineer to ensure perfect functionality for future trips. When making long passages, sailors use meteorological forecasts to determine weather windows. Weather windows can be compared to playing that old video game Frogger, but instead of dodging cars, you are dodging heavy offshore storms. Delaying our departure from Newport to let one storm pass meant we might not reach our destination before another storm hit Bermuda. On the morning after strong winds buffeted Islandia against its mooring, our captain determined that an immediate cast-off would allow us to arrive in Bermuda three and a half days hence ahead of 55 knot winds born out of a mid-Atlantic storm front. Sunset at mid-ocean was beautiful, but it foretold the ominous nature of the coming storms. Armed with the latest navigational aids, Islandia's monochromatic mid-range radar proved one of our most useful tools. As the wind speed indicator topped 45 knots, the radar screen betrayed the location of an unending squall line. Storm after storm approached from starboard, and as soon as the ferocity of one weather cell passed, another intensely bright green grouping of pixels engulfed the bridge in a glow of ominous green ambient light. The nighttime squalls passed without significant incident, and the morning's updating of the ship's logbooks reflected the severity of the storms. Though our seas remained in what is known in seamen's terms as a confused state, the sunrise skies were clear and our course held true toward Bermuda. Land ho! Upper atmospheric weather phenomenon often cause clouds to part around Bermuda, allowing sunlight to pierce through an otherwise impenetrable cloud layer. When this phenomenon is in effect, cascading sunlight highlights the entirety of Bermuda, allowing it to be seen from further away than would otherwise be possible. The Bermuda Customs Office granted us authorization to set anchor in the middle of St. George's Harbor. With more storms approaching, we faced a big blow within the next five hours. A 750-pound anchor secured fast to the strong holding seabed by 450 feet of road allowed our vessel to swing in a wide semicircle arc as shifting 55-knot winds blew across the harbor. 
Excited with the prospects of exploring Bermuda's cemeteries, I made my way to Dawes Bay across Grenadier Lane from my first cemetery. In the 1880s, pioneers of Bermuda experienced a yellow fever epidemic. This military cemetery contains many sailors who were stricken by yellow fever and suffered terribly through their final days. Two miles from this military cemetery lies Nonsuch Island, which served as a yellow fever quarantine hospital. My initial plan to use public transportation to explore the cemeteries of Bermuda fell through when a dispute between the Bermudian government and the country's labor unions caused all bus services and all government services to be canceled. I opted to rent a motor scooter, though torrential downpours made travel difficult. Devonshire Parish was named after the first Earl of Devonshire, William Cavendish. The old Devonshire Church Cemetery sits just off Middle Road, roughly equidistant from the North Shore and the South Shore. This is a hilly cemetery, though its steep grades are well groomed and maintained by parishioners of the two chapels located amongst the burial plots. Enjoying a brief respite from tropical storms, I rode off to find St. John's Anglican Churchyard. St. John's Anglican Church of Pembroke Parish is huddled between sports complexes and finely maintained homes. This area seems like a dynamic community which enjoys local sports such as netball, softball, and tennis. They take great pride in their school system and that pride shows in the respect they show for their parish graveyard. Amongst the neat rows of grave plots lie departed scholars, businessmen, and sailors. A short distance from St. John's Cemetery is a smaller yet equally maintained graveyard which contains one of my favorite grave markers on Bermuda. Grace Methodist Church Cemetery is nestled amongst Cemetery Road and Cemetery Lane. A trip to Bermuda would not be complete without a stop in Hamilton, the nation's capital. During my trip, political strife was gripping the people of Bermuda and a social uprising was occurring in Hamilton as well as the rest of the nation. Cold and wet from a day full of exploration in the rain, I made quick headway back to St. George's Harbor. Bermuda is wholly beautiful with its low cliffs and rugged coastline. I passed St. Mark's with its 102-foot steeple, Marsden Cemetery near Bermuda's famous pink beaches, and I even popped onto Church Folly Lane to view the unfinished church begun in the 1800s. My planned departure from Bermuda was delayed one full day because of the government shutdown and my unorthodox entry into the country. On my flight back to the United States, I peered out my window with eagle's eyes. With each break in the clouds, I scanned the ocean below in a vain attempt to spot sailing vessels on the ocean's surface. Soon enough, the U.S. coastline came into view, and before long, the cold U.S. winter was before me, and I was once again exploring the snow-covered cemeteries of home. Travel often fills me with an additional wanderlust, and one great adventure necessitates another. But flights leave daily, and with great anticipation, I look forward to my next cemetery expedition.